Caitlin, I want you to know that I fought for Mo with everything I had that night. From the moment that I got home, I started doing chest compressions which was the longest 10 minutes of my entire life. I remember feeling so relieved when the police arrived, that help was finally there. People who really knew what they were doing and who could help me care for her. I fought for her afterwards when I was pulled from my home by police and taken downstairs. I initially refused to go to the police station that night because I didn't want her to be alone. In one of the body cam videos, I say something along the lines of, I can't leave her. I'm the only one she has here. I couldn't understand why they weren't bringing her downstairs to the ambulance so that they could rush her to the hospital. I asked one of the officers why they weren't bringing her down. And that's when he told me that she unfortunately didn't make it. That was the first moment that night when I realized that there was no coming back from this. I think I had just assumed that as soon as she was taken to a hospital, that she was going to be okay. It never actually crossed my mind in the chaos of that night that she wouldn't be alive, that she would die, that she was already dead when I arrived home. I was questioned for almost three hours that night they finally let me wash the blood off my hands in the police station bathroom. And I'll never forget that moment in the bathroom. Watching the sink turn red and wanting to put it back on my hands because it was the only thing I had left of her. <clears throat> Your actions caused that pain. I remember waking up a few hours later in my dad's bed with my sister and realizing that it wasn't a dream, that it was all real. I'd asked the detective over and over again the previous night when and how they were gonna notify Mo's family. For what felt like an eternity the next morning, I waited for her mom and dad to call me. Finally, Karen called me and it was the hardest phone call of my life. She was wailing screaming. She wasn't speaking words at first. It was raw and guttural. It was the vocalization of grief. Her world had stopped. She was confused and in disbelief. She kept saying over and over again, who would ever want to hurt my baby? Her mom asked me, if I thought she had been raped. I told her no. She asked me if I thought it was quick. And I said yes, I thought it was quick, even though I didn't know. At no point in my life did I think I would ever have to tell someone's mother that I thought their daughter's death was quick. Your actions caused that pain. I've watched Karen sink to the floor in her kitchen because she was sobbing so hard and could no longer stand. I've watched her experience her first Mother's Day without her daughter, surrounded by wildflowers and her children's friends. I've watched her put lights and pumpkins on Mo's gravesite. I've watched her ride her bike and pedal harder because that's what Mo would have wanted. I've watched her in the darkest days 
not be able to get out of bed because she had nothing left. I watched her grieve for her daughter, who she will never get to see grow up anymore, get married, skyrocket in her career, inspire others further, have children. I've seen her open her heart to others through this loss and share her vulnerability and deep well of wisdom. I've seen her sit in this courtroom every single day with her head held high and bear witness to what happened to her incredible daughter. I sat with her as she visited my house for the first time and laid on the floor of the bathroom in a fetal position, stroking the ground, sobbing and crying out loud about how much she missed her. She turned onto her back and laid right where Mo had laid and taken her final breath. And my God, does Karen and Mo look exactly alike? I've watched her become friends with all of my friends and celebrate their accomplishments on my own. I've watched her continue to be the best mother, even though I can't imagine how painful the days must feel. I've watched her smile and laugh and still somehow find joy in life. I've witnessed her strength through this all, and I've been inspired by her daily in this slog that we've called life recently. It has been exhausting showing up every day here in court, listening, watching, reliving every moment from so many different angles. It feels so real all over again. I go home every night to my house after watching video after video of it all day here, and there's Mo's ashes sitting on my bedside table waiting for me. I'm struck by how much this has affected so many people. I've watched your parents in court every day, not once smiling or interacting with anyone, just waiting to see what happens to their daughter. I've watched my own dad struggle to look at the videos and the audio throughout the trial. I've seen Colin take the stand, unable to even sit fully upright as he answered question after question about the innermost pieces of his life, a man whose life has also been turned upside down by this tragedy. The ripple effect is almost incomprehensible. It's also unbelievably sad and painful any way you look at it. So many people in this room have lost so much. It's incredibly difficult to understand someone's life, how they lived, what they meant to others. Words feel completely inadequate right now, and they probably always will. How do you distill a life? The more I think on that question, the more I have to look at those people around me that were impacted so deeply by Mo. I'll forever be honored to have known her, to have held her as a close friend, both in life and in death. And I'll have to continue seeking out ways to honor her legacy. We have to live bigger, more fully, with more vulnerability and open hearts for her. That's what she would have wanted. I want to be riding bikes with Mo, cooking new recipes, waking up on Christmas morning together, plotting new businesses with her, growing older and hopefully wiser, and building and creating what we want in this life together. Instead, her ashes are on the ground in Vermont. I'm putting in the work right now to process it all and continue healing. I'm trying to open my heart even more and just let it all wash over me. I still feel so many things. Guilt for not protecting Mo, for not coming home sooner. I'm angry at you, at the utter, utter tragic nature, at the senselessness, 
at not being able to hear Mo's voice again. I feel deep sadness for the road ahead that Mo's family must continue to walk. Deep sadness for Matt, for now being an only child. And deep sadness for you and for your family. Mo once said, if we're not willing to risk catastrophic failure, we're probably not dreaming, living, or loving the right way. I'm going to read that one more time. If we're not willing to risk catastrophic failure, we're probably not dreaming, living, or loving the right way. That is profound. That is powerful. That is Mel. She was not afraid to break things to make them better. That's what she's doing to each of us. She's breaking us down and teaching us how to rebuild the world around us in a deeper, more meaningful way. And for that, we have to be grateful. We have to be grateful to her for living with such poise and vibrancy, for truly seeing those around her as they were, for pushing us to do better and to be better humans. Those closest to, to, to her knew she had no limits and it was an honor, a privilege, to be in her orbit, even for only a short time. Even after all of this, I feel hope. I hope that I can live a life that she would be proud of, and I'll carry her with me each day. I choose light, I choose joy, and I choose love. And Caitlin, I really hope that you can find that too. Sharon Wilson, y'all. say I want to thank your honor for giving us this opportunity it really means a lot Caitlin Armstrong I'm not sure if my words can penetrate your heart but I'm gonna try I hate what you did to my beautiful daughter it was very selfish and cowardly that violent act on May 11. It was cowardly because you never chose to face her woman to woman in a civil conversation. She would have listened. She was an amazing listener. She would have cared about your feelings. She was a caring, empathetic person. If you allowed yourself to actually know her, you never ever would have wanted to hurt her. This never would have happened. You and Colin could have had a beautiful life together. You destroyed that. You ruined your life, your family's lives, our lives, and crushed the hearts of many more. When you shot Mariah in the heart, you shot me. Matt in their hearts. You shot Mariah's cousins and aunts and uncles and all the people who loved her pierced their hearts. You will have to live with your choices and its consequences just like all of us do on this planet because you are a human being created in the image of God. I pray for your healing. The only way that can begin is to admit your guilt, own your actions, and seek forgiveness, not just from us, but most importantly from your Creator. Jesus is your very best friend. He is the one who can cover this sin 
because he is the only righteous one who suffered on our behalf, sacrificing his body on a cross for our sake. Only you can choose to cry out to him and be redeemed. He can melt in your heart of stone with his unconditional love, mercy, and grace. It's up to you. There's no winner in this story. Your actions have caused all sides to suffer. There's a ripple effect of sorrow upon sorrow upon sorrow. Mariah is free of the sorrow, though. She is more alive today than any of us here. Mariah is in the presence of God's pure light and love, and nothing, nothing can ever hurt her again. You killed her earthly body, but her spirit is so very much alive, and you can never change that. I am confident in my hope. That's what I named my new puppy. <laughs> I'm so confident in that hope of spending eternity with her and our loving creator who made this vast and beautiful universe.